So this boulder in the riverbed here neatly encapsulates a lot of Himalayan history and it has evidence for several of the episodes of Himalayan deformation and metamorphism. And I'll just talk you through some of the main points of those and show you some of the evidence in this boulder. First of all, up here we have a dark coloured gneiss which is amphibole rich and it's a mafic rock. And this was probably some kind of a dike or a sill of mafic igneous rock originally. That would have been intruded into this paler rock here. This is now a garnet biotite gneiss with a lot of felspar in it, but it would probably originally have been some kind of a metasediment on a passive continental margin. There are various patterns you can see in the paler gneiss here with biotite and garnet. One of these patterns is a series of anastomosing or undulating lines running across the rock like this. And this is a planar foliation that was formed when the rock was squashed during the collision between India and Asia. Now along here, this foliation is disrupted by this patch here, which looks as if the two components of the gneiss, the dark and the light colours, are separating out from each other. So you have patches of light coloured material here, which is mainly felspar and quartz, surrounded by rims of darker material like this, which is mainly composed of biotite. Now the reason for this texture is that the rock was so hot, it was about 650 to 700 degrees centigrade, that it's actually started to melt. And this is the evidence for melt. It's a rock that we call migmatite, which just means mixed rock. So these patches of quartz and felspar in here are actually granite, essentially. They're what was the original melt that was forming in the rock. And while the melt was forming, it was leaving behind these darker rims of biotite which didn't melt. Where we see migmatite in the rock, such as this little pod like here, which is mainly quartz and felspar, this indicates that the rock was partially melting, but the melt had not formed into large enough bodies to move very far, and so essentially it's frozen in place in the rock. But here we see another feature, cutting right through the rock, and this, the light colour of this is also mainly quartz and felspar, and this indicates that this is also a body of melt. But in this case you can see that it cuts very sharply through the rock, cutting across the foliation which is running across like this. Now this indicates that, once again, this was probably formed by partial melting because it has a black mineral called tourmaline in, which is a very good indicator of partial melting. But it probably formed at some distance away in a large enough body that it could then intrude and cut through the gneiss. And so it's then cut through the gneiss to this point here and it's actually truncated this patch of migmatite, this patch of quartz felspar melt here and gone right the way through the foliation in the gneiss as well, forming a vein of granitic material. One more point about this mafic layer which is rather interesting. You can see that the mafic layer is not continuous but it's broken up into different segments. The reason for this is that during the squashing, during collision between Asia, India and Asia, the mafic layer is much stronger than the gneiss that surrounds it. So while the gneiss here deforms plastically, rather like plasticine, and squashes to form a foliation, this dark layer actually breaks into different pieces. And what's really nice about this feature here is that as it breaks into these different segments, the melt that's forming in the gneiss rushes in to fill the void in between those different pieces so you get pods of quartz felspar material which used to be granitic melt frozen into those what we call boudin necks. And this process of breaking up of a layer like this is called boudinage. If you would like more information about Himalayan geology, our research or available PhD studentships please contact us at the Department of Environment, Earth and Ecosystems.